Welcome back. Um, this is the second half of the afternoon sessions. Um, we're going to hear about um, building on 100 scale, 100 times scale, sorry. This is Simon Kelly. He's the senior developer of uh, Demaji. And let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, my name is Simon Kelly. Um, I work for a company called Demagi. Um, I want to preface this talk by saying um, there have been a couple of other talks on scale. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to scale your app. Um, this is more of a um, personal or experience that we've had at Demagi, uh, kind of a case study into what we've done over the last uh, 14 months or so that I've been working on this project um, to get ourselves ready for something that, that's going to happen in the future, which I'll tell you about. Um, so just a quick structure of the talk. I'm going to tell you about our company, what we do, and to give you some context, um, the story of scale, why, why it is that we, we're doing what we're doing, or we're needing to have this project, um, a bit about how we started to think about our system and rethink what we, what we need to do to achieve um, the goals that we have, and then get into some of the implementation details um, and have a few um, learnings at the end. So Demagi uh, is a company that was founded out of MIT Media Lab in 2002. Um, really the goal was to bring the passion of the open source community to tackle difficult and interesting problems in health. Since then we've branched out into a bunch of other different sectors, but we still um, have most of our focus on the health sector. Um, in the US, it's a US-based company with offices around the world. Um, in the US we're kind of incorporated as a, a a benefit corp, which is like a social enterprise. Um, and what this means is that we um, profit isn't our, our top priority. We actually have three goals. One is to make an impact in the world. Um, the other is to do it with a team who are satisfied in their jobs. And the third is to obviously make some money and be sustainable and, um, at the same time. So I want to give you some context about the kind of work that we do um, because I'm going to tell you about the platform that we use to build mobile applications, and I want you be, to be able to contextualize what kind of mobile applications these are. So this lady, she's a, an agricultural mentor who works in India. Her and the organization she works with um, uh, visit farmers, local farmers in the area. These are not commercial farmers, these are like rural farmers. Um, they give them training, they help them to understand um, about uh, fertilizer, Um, and obviously this is to try and improve their farming ability. This, uh, this guy, he's a, a community health worker in um, Kenya. Uh, his job uh, is to work with the clinic and an NGO in his area. He goes out and he visits pregnant women um, and, their and uh, children after they're born. He registers them and trains them on nutrition and, um, and hygiene. And uh, he also kind of tries to make sure that they get into the clinic for their vaccinations and all those kind of things. And also that checking for da any danger signs in the pregnancy and referring them to the clinic if, if that need be. So he also visits them during their pregnancy um, and then probably follows up with the child after they're born and in some, case e some cases even up to the age of five. Um, tracking the children from a nutrition and growth point of view. So with that in mind, um, what we do is we help these people and the organizations that they, they belong to, we call them frontline workers. They are out in the field, they're not based in an office, often in pretty low resource settings. And we want to empower them to, to do their jobs better. And we do that by giving them a mobile phone and a mobile application on that phone that simplifies their workflow, improves their workflow, it gives them additional resources, and basically improves their ability to succeed at their job. And a um, added benefit of that is that we are able to collect data, make that ad data available to the organizations for reporting, decision making, um, which obviously with a paper-based system doesn't really happen very, much, very well. Um, these applications are able to create and update records, search the records, do decision support and multimedia, um, and they do that in these low resource settings around the world. So mostly low connectivity, uh, or no connectivity, um, and um, yeah, that, that kind of thing. 
the way we do that is we have um, a cloud platform called Comcare um, that allows you, you being a non-programmer, not any of you guys, um, like NGOs and those kind of people to build mobile applications, deploy these to cell phones. Android at the moment is our primary platform and get them into the hands of the mobile, of the frontline workers who then use them in their day-to-day -day jobs when they are doing whatever they're doing in the field. And when I say that they work offline, I really mean offline. So like all the complex workflow and all that stuff works completely offline. What kind of apps can you build? Um, they're basically structured applications um, to create and update and, and search records. So you can create a record for your farmer or pregnant mother or whatever. Capture data about those people. Um, perform complex workflow and validation and decision support. And then deliver, also deliver media, reports, and do GIS and mapping tasks as well. Um, so you can really do quite a lot. And all of this can be done offline, obviously, except maybe the mapping stuff, um, if you're downloading map and um, templates and stuff. Google Calendar is reminding me about something. Uh, okay, so that's a bit of context about what we do and the, the platform that we have. I will talk to you a bit more, talk a bit more about it, obviously, just now. Um, as of this point in time, we as a company have worked in a lot of different projects, over 500 projects in 60 different countries around the world. Uh, we have about 100 staff spread over our four offices, which is Boston, US, Cape Town, Senegal, and um, Delhi in India. And we comprise of a, a wide variety of different skills. Quite a lot of developers, probably about a third of us are on the tech team, and the rest are all sorts of people. So that's our platform, and um, what is this thing about scale? So when we started off as a company, um, we were doing really small projects, and the sector as a whole that we worked in was doing small projects. Um, mobile phones in health, mobile phones in agriculture, these are not things that were common. People were experimenting, doing, doing pilots. And when I joined the company three years ago, a big project was maybe 50 to 100 users. Um, as of this year, well, the last couple of years, obviously the technology is maturing, the, the sectors are maturing, they're becoming more um, open to this idea of using mobile devices, and so the projects are growing at a huge scale. So um, just around the, around the world, in Burkina Faso, they're using clinical tools for in 25% of all their clinics nationally, and in Senegal, they have a supply chain management project, which we also do some work in. Um, also a national, um, national project, Guatemala is scaling a malaria and nutrition app to 9,000 um, users. Ghana has uh, got a community health uh, worker um, and supply chain project that's scaling up nationally. Mozambique, there's a national push on a community health worker application. Tanzania as well. Um, Myanmar, uh, scaling to 12,000 midwives around the country. And India, which is by far our biggest project, and scaling to 100,000 community health workers in the next year or so. So, and those are pretty big projects, and I just want to emphasize, like, these are not apps that the general public downloads. These are apps that a company will buy a phone, install the app, give it to their worker, give them training, and then send them out into the field. So doing that for 100,000 people and on 100,000 phones is a logistical problem in and of itself. Um, let me tell you a little about, about some of the sort of data model that we, that we do. So obviously we have mobile users. These are the people, the, the users on the, on the actual device. We also have web users who are the users who are viewing the reports, creating the applications, all that kind of stuff, managing the deployments. Um, we're not too concerned about the web users because the ratio of web to user to mobile user is pretty high. And so uh, we don't, we're not really worrying about scaling the, that side of the application. Um, Cases, so these are what we call the records that you create on the phone. Um, they, uh, you know, they, they create it, update it on the phone, um, and the way that actually works is that the phone creates transactions against the case, and then we, um, when the phone syncs with the server, when it's got a connection, it submits all the transactions. The server reconciles all of those transactions, especially if there have been transactions created by other phones or um, by the application on the web and then um, delivers the sort of uh, final version of the case back down to the phone. Um, a typical device will have anywhere between 100 and like 20,000 of these cases on the phone. Um, so 
then the numbers can be pretty big. Um, and you can also share the, the records between different phones. So if there's multiple workers working in the same area, they can share records so they can both visit the same people or the same founders and without having to create new records. Um, these cases are, are made up of, of data elements. And so you can think about this as like a key value mapping. So this might be two transactions, um, one that creates the case and sets various fields, and another one that updates the case with uh, like a next visit date or something like that. Um, so these are the only models I'm going to talk about. Obviously, we have a lot, and this is sort of a simplified example, but just to give you a bit of context. So with, in the next year or so, with these big projects coming on board, this is kind of what we're expecting. 150,000 mobile users, 4 million new cases created per month. Um, so that's excluding any existing cases in the system. And uh, about 4 billion sort of data elements. To give you an idea of what, how this compares to what we're doing today, it's about a 600% increase in those two and a 2,500% increase in the data elements. So it's a pretty big kind of scale increase. Our current um, increase month to month is about 5%, which is a very man manageable scale increase. Uh, so this is obviously a much more exponential um, kind of increase. These are the kind of numbers of new users that we've registered uh, each year. Um, and in 2017, obviously, that's going through the roof with all of these new projects coming on board. What this doesn't show is that some of these projects, like the one in India, where I said 100,000 users, that's phase one. Phase two is to get to 1.4 million users in the next three years. So that puts the graph a little bit higher. Um, over a five-year timeline, um, we're expecting to have 10 million cases created of trillion data points and be collecting about five petabytes of data, um, which is, for us, a completely stupid scale from where we are right now. So that's why the talk is called Scaling for 100x. This is obviously not kind of Facebook or Amazon scale, but for us it's big. <laughs> um, so what, what is our architecture? We've got pretty standard um, Python sort of architecture. We use Django workers um, with Nginx for proxy and, and that kind of thing. We use two databases, Postgres and a NoSQL JSON document store called CouchDB. Um, CouchDB is actually our primary data store, and Postgres is sort of a secondary data store. We use Celery and Redis uh, for caching and, and um, background processing. And we use Elasticsearch for um, various reporting tasks. And we populate Elasticsearch by stream processing from CouchDB. CouchDB has a school feature where you can listen to a change feed of all things that changed in the database, um, and then we just process that and stick it into Elastic. Now, this seems like a pretty good architecture, um, and uh, when we started thinking about these huge projects coming on board, um, oh, sorry, one other thing. Uh, in our production cluster environments, one CouchDB is actually too small, so we have a CouchDB cluster. Um, so when we think about this uh, from a scaling point of view, we started to think about um, what sort of properties do we want the system to have? And we started rethinking about what kind of data do we have and where is that data sitting? So some of the principles that we want these different components in our system to have is we want them to be a good technology fit. You know, sometimes you can use a system just for legacy reasons or whatever, but it's not actually a good, good fit. Um, horizontally scalable. We're a multi-tenant um, kind of platform, so our production environment has thousands of different projects for different organizations. So obviously we, we need to be able to scale that, um, up, scale that up as the demand grows. Open source, we're a pretty big, um, uh, we have a pretty big bias towards open source. Partly that's because of our sort of company ethos, and partly it's because of the work that we do. Um, there's, for like the India project, we're actually spinning up a whole new cluster for them that's going to be in, a, in the government data center. Um, and so there's various issues around costs, lock-in, and, and control. Um, and being devs, we also just like to be able to fix stuff and add new features where, you know, where we see stuff's missing. And then finally, um, maturity. Uh, we're definitely on the slightly more conservative side, I would say, in terms of like just throwing, checking out new technologies. Um, and I think as you scale, that kind of becomes more of a factor. When you're just building a small project and you're able to iterate on that really quickly and do stuff, you can use some new technology and, and it's fine. 
but um, the bigger you get, the kind of more you realize that um, doing an upgrade from Bootstrap 2 to Bootstrap 3 can be a really painful process. And so we want to use tools that are, are mature, reasonable upgrade paths, good tooling, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if we apply this to those components that I talked about, um, we've got some that are match all of these, they're horizontally scalable, good technology fit, etc., etc. We've got a few that um, these ones aren't horizontally scalable necessarily. Um, the stream processing is stuff that we've written ourselves, so we, we know how to scale that when we need to, and it's not right now. Nginx, but that's not a concern, that's a standard um, way to do that. And Postgres, uh, we're also not too worried about that at this point because it's not our primary data store. The big issue turns out to be this uh, CouchDB cluster. Um, although it is already sort of horizontally scalable, um, it's a, actually we use a, an online service, like a database service, because when we started using this, uh, there wasn't an open source clustered version of CouchDB available. And so we had to use this online service. Um, and uh, so that, that's one problem, is, is cost. It's, it costs us a lot to scale this up. Um, each new node that we add is very expensive. Um, it's also something that's completely out of, out of our control. If we want to set up a new um, cluster that's going to need more than one CouchDB, then we have to you know, pay massive license fees and everything to get it set up. Um, Lock-in, obviously, and then design. So the technology fits, I've put like a half box because um, it's fine for some of our stuff, but it's actually a pretty poor fit for some of our other, other stuff. Um, yeah, some of the design challenges, things like uh, it's got very limited querying support. It is a, a JSON document store. You can build like views on, on the JSON documents, but they take a long time to index, um, and then you can't do any dynamic querying on those anyway. So uh, it definitely has um, some issues. If you've got a very static data model, um, like there, there are places where it's a really good fit for a lot of things, but um, not, it turns out, for us that much. We started using it initially because of some of the um, replication features that it has, but we don't actually use those anymore. So, And then, I said, we started rethinking about um, our data. What kind of data do we have and where is it stored? So we've kind of split it up into these four groups. We have high volume primary data. Those are the cases and data elements and stuff that I talked about. We've got a whole bunch of low volume primary data, like users, groups, the app configurations, all of that stuff. Analytics data, that's like the primary data that we've like processed in some way to make it easier for reporting. And then we've got a whole bunch of binary data, attachments, multimedia, that kind of thing. And at the moment, this is where they're stored. Everything <laughs> is in Couch, and then we use Postgres for some of the low volume primary data, and we use Elasticsearch for some of the analytics data. So we thought, well, that's not maybe the best idea. Um, so we wanted to move that out of, the, out of couch because uh, of the scaling issues and also because of the design issues. The low volume primary data we find with where it is now. Elastic, I mean, sorry, the analytics data, not couch is definitely not a good fit for that because of the dynamic querying support and that kind of thing. We're very happy with Elastic and then we started using Postgres more for that as well. And the binary data, definitely not good for couch. It does support storing binary data, but it's a database. Um, you know, there are better things for doing that with. And also, because of the cost of the, like the machines that we're using for that, it's, it's a bad use of the cost of the, of the disk space. And so we ended up uh, using ReactCS for that, and we've actually just completed migrating all of our binary data to our ReactCS cluster, which is pretty cool. So, um, so now we, like, We've identified that um, this, this is kind of the main area that we want to focus on, the, the CouchDB cluster. Um, for various reasons, we, we think we want to move our data out of there and we'll do something else with it. Um, but we don't know what it is we want to do yet. Um, so how do, we, how do we go about thinking about, of all the things that are out there, the spectrum of databases, how do we pick one? And how do we evaluate that against what we're already using? So we kind of produced a... Um, a matrix, if you will, of like uh, things that we wanted to evaluate databases against. We started with the, the list of things that I talked about already, and then we added some more technical things, transactional properties, speed, secondary index ports, querying ability, and then some um, more operational things, like how easy is this going to be to implement, and what kind of maintenance burden is going to have on our team. We then kind of took a, a pretty big list of different databases that we thought might be suitable. Cassandra, HBase, 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We included Couch to be in there just for a comparison. And then we um, evaluated it against all of those criteria. And we did this um, by like reading documentation, reading, you know, talking to other people, how they found using it, were there issues, etc., etc., etc. And kind of giving a, a pretty um, basic rudimentary rating for each of these areas. And from that, we were able to um, bring it down to a shortlist. Um, and the shortlist was uh, Postgres, Mongo, and CouchDB. Um, obviously, Couch is there just as a comparison. Um, we understood that maybe, in fact, it was better for us to just stay with what we got. Um, so we definitely wanted to include that in, there, um, in the comparison. And having identified that shortlist, we, um, we started to do some testing. We built a prototype in Flask that could talk to all of these three backends um, that ran some of our core processing code, um, which was the main kind of stuff that we were interested in testing. Um, and then we, we hit it with some benchmarking stuff. We used, uh, mostly used Tsung, which is an Erlang-based um, benchmarking tool, um, pretty powerful, and uh, we were able to, to simulate a wide variety of different, pay, uh, different workloads. We started really simple, testing basic read and write throughput, and started getting more and more complex to more and more realistic um, kind of workloads that we would expect um, in a production environment. And we spent quite a long time testing, produced a massive amount of data, um, and in the end, the results weren't uh, completely conclusive. It wasn't like, oh, this is obviously the best database to use. We eliminated Mongo pretty quickly, um, for um, just from a, um, I think it was transactional throughput point of view. Um, and uh, then we spent most of the time looking at Couch versus, versus Postgres. Uh, this is one of the benchmark graphs. Uh, it showed us that uh, Couch was quite a bit better at low load, but as soon as the load got it higher, then Postgres kind of took over. This graph only stops there, but um, we were able to benchmark, particularly Postgres, up to much higher um, kind of user loads. There were obviously other factors as well. I mean, the cost of, of the ArcarchDB cluster was one, and the design uh, restriction, 10 minutes. <sighs> okay, I'm going to speed up. <laughs> um, so anyway, we chose Postgres. Um, let's talk about some of the imita implementation stuff. <laughs> this, is the, this is the one that's interesting. Um, okay, so a good test suite, that was pretty critical if you're going to change your database. Um, we uh, made this decorator that we were able to use to run the tests on both different backends. We knew we would have to have them both in, in production at the same time because uh, we weren't going to migrate all our current projects in one go. We were going to do it like project by project. Um, and so we had a nice uh, little decorator to run the tests twice, once for each different backend. Um, we needed a code branching mechanism. We already had like a feature flag thing that we built, so we were able to reuse that and then add in some extra stuff so it was easy to override on unit tests and also easy to override for like management commands in Django if we wanted to do something specific. Um, so we used like thread locals to, to do override stuff. Um, the data model, we'd already done that prototype, so that was really useful for, um, as a reference for the data model. Um, obviously in Couch everything is JSON, um, and we use pretty big documents, so relationships and like nested models in SQL ends up being like um, joint tables. And we use standard J uh, Django models for all that stuff. And then we built a lot of different uh, data access interfaces and processing interfaces so that uh, regardless of where you're using it, you could just like create an accessor and get a case. Um, and then, um, so that's kind of what it looks like. Depending on the project, it would return you a different imp implementation. And the implementations are pretty straightforward. Um, you can see we're still using um, uh, just straight old Django um, queries there. We started doing sharding at a, at a later stage, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Now, <laughs> we investigated two different sharding options, uh, one in the app layer and one using like a, uh, in the database layer. Uh, we again went back to the prototyping um, app that we built and tested them out. We ended up going with the... Go away, Google with the, um, the proxy approach, um, and we used something called PL proxy, which is a, a Postgres add-on. Um, and the way, what that does is it gives you, um, you configure the proxying stuff in a proxy database, and it does RPC calls to your sharded databases. And this was actually originally developed by Skype, um, and is now an open source project. Um, 
And we went this way because it was one less thing for us to maintain and also one less thing for us to develop. Um, and it also seems to be pretty, pretty popular, good documentation and simple to use. A couple of ways that this works. Um, if you're wanting to get something by, it's like hashed ID, so like cases are hashed by the ID. Um, you call a stub function in the proxy DB, it hashes it to one of the logical shards, and that gets mapped to one of the physical databases. Um, you can also, uh, if you're getting something and you don't know which database it's on because you're not using the hash ID, you can just query everything. Um, or if you're getting multiple objects, you can like split up a list and then only query the databases where you know the, those objects are going to be. Uh, so these, uh, this requires writing SQL functions instead of doing the queries in Django, um, which was uh, not the greatest, but also was, was fine. And this is what a SQL function might look like to select something from a table. Um, and then in the proxy database, you have this sort of stub function that tells it um, how this is going to get mapped to one of the logical shards. So this is what our sort of final state looks like. We've got Django, we're talking to two primary databases. One is the proxy and one is an unsharded DB with all our unsharded models. And then we've got however many um, uh, sharded databases. We also have environments where we don't need sharding. Um, and so we're able to just um, put all the SQL functions directly in the uncharted DB and talk straight to that as if it were the same thing, um, which is really nice. And so we do that mostly in dev and then some of our smaller deployments. How does this work in Python? Um, that's what we were doing with Django, um, and this is what you can do with, uh, with Django still. If you're wanting to get a whole object, you just do a raw query. If it returns the results with the right um, kind of column names, then Django is very nice, and it just makes you a Python object, uh, which is really cool. Um, for stuff that doesn't return like whole objects, like you just want to get one field, then you just use a cursor, um, run the query, and then um, uh, get the results out of the, out of the cursor. So it's pretty straightforward. Writing data is a bit more problematic. Uh, we wanted to have a clean sort of Python way of doing that. So like save the case and just pass it the case object. Um, the SQL function kind of looks like this. Uh, we wanted that also to be quite clean. So we just call pass the case as the kind of case table type and then pull that out in the insert. The way, if you want to do that, the way you have to do that in SQL is a bit nasty. You have to like create this row thing and cast it as a table, and that we didn't want to have to write that. Thankfully, uh, Psycho PG2 has a cool way of registering at type adapters, so we could just create some functions that built that horrible thing for us, um, and then we were shielded, most of you, we were shielded from doing all of that ourselves. And that does all the escaping and that kind of thing as well, which is nice. And there's a link if you want to go and see what that looks like on GitHub. So in the, in the app layer, now we've got all our SQL functions, and we're not using any Django queries, so we disabled the Django RM queries completely. We just did this with a couple of mix-ins, uh, a restricted manage, extended manager object that just throws an exception if you try to create a normal query, and like a, a model mix-in that um, also throws an exception if you try and call .save or .delete or whatever, just to make sure that nobody's doing any funny stuff. Um, in the DB, uh, in Django as well, it has built-in support for multiple databases. Um, so you can define um, like database routers that tell Django for this query, what do I, which database do I connect to? So that was pretty straightforward. We did have to do a little bit of extra work to, um, because some of our environments aren't sharded and some of them are, then obviously like we have to um, adapt the router for those different circumstances. Um, but that was pretty easy and straightforward uh, and the documentation was pretty good on that as well. Uh, we also wrote some basic tools for managing the cluster, like creating the, the configuration in Postgres, um, and like doing migrations in Django by default is a bit janky. If you've got multiple databases, you have to call multiple migrate commands with each database. If you've got a whole bunch of databases, that gets tedious, so we just created a um, command to do all of them in once. So what does our system look like now? Um, same kind of basic setup. Uh, we introduced React CS, which I mentioned. We introduced these, um, this um, Postgres uh, cluster. Um, obviously, Postgres doesn't have a, like a change feed that you can listen to. Um, so we introduced this thing called Kafka, which is a distributed um, message log type of thing, uh, which is really cool. If you, if you haven't looked at it, you should check it out. And then we publish straight to that from Django and then our stream processing consumes the Kafka logs directly. Um, some quick learnings, a uh, few gotchas with 
uh, PL proxy, obviously you're talking to a proxy database and transactions are with the proxy and so any RPC calls are um, executed in auto commit transactions. So if you roll back a transaction, it doesn't actually have any effect because the, the RPC call has already happened. Um, this wasn't such a big thing for us because we already, our core processing code is already written in a sort of atomic fashion. Um, so we do everything and then we do like a, a save at the end. Uh, but we did have to do things like, uh, if you're saving a case, we put more um, stuff in the SQL function, in the one SQL function, instead of maybe breaking that up into a couple of different functions. Um, but that was, it wasn't too bad. Obviously, returning results from multiple databases, if you're calling multiple databases, you're going to get multiple results back, and so you have to either um, cater for that in the SQL itself, or like in Python, if you're doing a sum, uh, you'll get one sum result from each database that you hit. And then the same for limiting and sorting. Those happen on the sort of RPC call databases. So if you sort, you're going to get back like a bunch of different sorted results. PL proxy doesn't handle that for you, so you just have to then sort that yourself in, in Python. And limiting as well, if you do a limit bit by 10 and you call 10 databases, you're going to get 100 results back. Um, so other learnings. This is a really big project. As I say, we've been going for like 14 months now. It's live on our, on our production sites, which is really great. Um, and we're rolling out the, the huge India project that's running out at the moment. Um, so, but this kind of project planning was pretty key. We spent a lot of time up front thinking about this, how we're going to do this, um, and uh, did a lot of um, like, you know, some thumb sucking. Okay, we've got 100,000 users. How much data are we going to have to deal with? What's our transaction going to look like? Uh, so we did a lot of thinking up front, built a whole bunch of Excel spreadsheets to do some calculations. And we also spoke to a lot of other people in the industry. Um, uh, we saw, uh, we went to an Instagram talk on their architecture, which was pretty similar actually. They do sharding in the, DB, in the, in the app layer, but not in the, in the DB layer like we were doing. Um, and like talked to SurveyMonkey and a whole bunch of other people in the industry to see what they were doing, how they handle um, you know, these kind of problems, uh, which was really useful in just informing our approach and, and our decisions. Uh, validating our decisions with data, that was really quite key. Um, you know, a big project like this is a huge investment for the company, so they want to make sure that we're actually A, doing the right thing and they should spend all this money on it. Um, so we spent a lot of time not doing those benchmarkings and like doing these predictions and that kind of stuff. Um, but I would say, you know, don't try too hard. As Flavio mentioned before, stats can lie. And if you try really hard to make your data support your decision, you can probably do it. Um, so just be careful that you're being objective with your data. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs> While that's going out, um, if you, you can go and sign up at comk.org um, and check out the system. It's basically free up until, like, I don't know, you can do a lot for free. Uh, so if you have any interest in seeing how it works, you can go and sign up. And all of our codes on GitHub as well. Yep. Um, awesome. Is this working? Perfect. So um, it seemed like you guys did a reasonable amount of trying to work around the fact that Django ORM didn't quite understand your approach with PL proxy or it didn't cater for it. Did you guys um, evaluate SQL Alchemy? We did evaluate SQL Alchemy. We use SQL Alchemy for um, one or two other things in our project. Uh, the reason we didn't do it with um, with this particular stuff is just because we wanted it to um, like we had quite a small team working on this, and we had quite a big development team in total. So we didn't want to like introduce a new component that would be like clash with everything else, and had just have this one place where we use this different tool um, for for doing that. And the Django side of it wasn't actually that hard. Um, I mean, it was a little bit of figuring out, but um, it was a fairly small amount of code uh, in the end. Awesome. And just a question about the storage of your um, JSON data. Uh, did you guys consider storing the JSON data directly in Postgres, as JSONB or HStore? We did, actually, um, and we do. Um, so the cases, we have a bunch of metadata metadata fields, like when it was created, date modified, etc., etc. But then the actual dynamic properties we store in an adjacent field. Okay. So with the, uh, the sharding stuff that you are doing there, so you guys are writing a lot of SQL functions. 
or are you actually just using that to root between your different data uh, databases or are you using it for business logic as well? And how much business logic, if, if any, are you writing good, with those SQL queries? Good question. Um, so we tried really hard to keep business logic out of the SQL. Um, I mean, all of that SQL code is, is version controlled in our, in our, in our app. Um, and we use Django migrations to you know, create those in the database and all that kind of thing. Um, we wanted to try and keep business logic out, so it's really just data access, um, calling functions to get data in um, and get data out. And the reason we had to use SQL functions is because that's how PL proxy works. It is an RPC framework. So you call a function on the proxy and it calls the same function on uh, like a, a remote database and then returns the result. So it, it works with functions, so we were constrained by that. So, so most of your business logic is still sitting in your... All of our business data. logic is still in the application, yeah. We do some basic like error checking and stuff, so you can't save a case that's like I don't know got weird stuff in it. But do we have any more questions over here? Hi, uh, this is probably really tangential, but um, I was just wondering if you had any special security um, considerations in all of this because this is um, fairly we do. Um, yeah. private data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are HIPAA compliant. HIPAA is a US kind of health data um, security framework. And so all of our, we, are, we run on Rackspace and dedicated machines. All of our data is uh, encrypted at, at rest. Um, everything is SSL and we have VPNs and like restricted logins and all that kind of stuff. And even the phones, the data is encrypted at rest on the phones as well. And so yeah, we definitely have a lot of uh, security and stuff. But in the application itself, it doesn't actually feature that much. It's normal, I mean, this is a web app. It's normal kind of security stuff that we, that we deal with. That's more the, on the server side, um, making sure stuff is encrypted and restricted access and that kind of thing. So you said that you were struggling with MongoDB earlier. Uh, yes. I just wanted to find out what exactly was the um, <coughs> throughput too low? Uh, was it writes, reads? What was the, the issue with MongoDB? Uh, it's a good question. Um, trying to remember. So uh, the benchmarking that we did, we initially had a hypothesis that it was going to be uh, we would have to optimize for writes because you know when a phone syncs, it writes, it sends a, us a whole bunch of data. Um, that turned out to be false um, because when we send those transactions through for the case, we have to read the cases out of the database, apply all the transactions, and then save it back into the database. So it turned out that for a real payload or a real workflow, uh, we had to optimize the write path. Um, I think Mongo, um, there were a couple of issues with Mongo. One was that, it, that we were questioning the technology for a little bit. Uh, I mean, it does have some dynamic query support. Um, but I think in the end it was mostly just the throughput. Um, we were using kind of a standard um, Mongo setup. We possibly, we did look into trying to um, make sure it had the right settings and stuff for performance, but um, it just couldn't handle the load really, really quickly. It just stopped handling the load that we were putting at it, which Couch and Postgres seemed to be able to handle fine. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. Anybody, any more questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. Simon? Cool, thanks.